Yeah, I saw him do. A, they were on a. They had a live live thing going on this morning. With with uh, yeah, with Dave Burnett. I don't think even Burnett's working. Wow. You know? And you know, he's about as busy as they get. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guy. Um, oh, I, I I actually never met him. Oh, he well he he lived around here for years, in Arlington, and I I met him that way, and I you see him on a job once in a while. And he's back in New York. He's from Utah originally. Let me let me welcome everybody that's joining us. Um, okay. Folks, we're going to start in about a minute. Um, let's let some other people uh, make their way into the show. And anyways. Um, Yeah, no, um, I, I saw uh, David Burnett at the, um, they, there was a lot, <laughs> there was a lot of talk about him going out to one of the hearings. I think it may have been the, one of the, the Mueller hearings and he had his big uh, view camera with him. Did you see, did you see those images? Yeah. <laughs> that was cool. Um, all right. Hey, thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Newman. And I'm the founder of Focus on the Story. We are a Washington DC based nonprofit that supports visual storytelling. So we had to cancel our annual festival, which would have started next week. And we're making up for it by moving all of our programming online. Uh, we've been doing weekly shows since April 1st and we're gonna continue through the end of June. Um, today, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to, um, we're call, I'm calling it one shot, okay? Um, we'll see if that sticks. Uh, the idea is that, I'm, that we bring one photographer on to talk about one image. And um, we're going to try to keep the conversation to about 30 minutes, uh, but we'll see how good the audience questions are today before we make that call. The, which, which reminds me, uh, ask questions today. We, we, we hopefully will have time to get to them. Uh, ask them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've also got the chat. Uh, you can also chat to us in the chat box, but we often don't see the questions unless they're in the Q&A box. When it comes time to, for questions, I will unmute you and ask and let you ask your question yourself. So be prepared for that. Find your unmute button now uh, at the bottom of your screen because you'll need to take your, your microphone off mute. So today, today's image is instantly recognizable by the millions of folks who have ever watched the drama series Homeland on, on Showtime. Uh, you know, long before I knew anything about this photo uh, and well before I met today's guests, I wondered about this image. Uh, Homeland was a show that my wife and I have, have had a love-hate relationship over eight seasons, uh, but we recently wrapped up the season finale. And within an hour of watching the season finale, I saw a post on Lloyd's Facebook page where he talked about this image. And, and it was then that I found out he was the, the photographer behind it. And, you know, over the years, I've always wondered, what does this image mean? You know, why are they using it in this show about international intrigue and, and terrorist plots? Uh, and we're gonna get to that, but first, let me give Lloyd a proper introduction. Lloyd Wolf is an award-winning photographer and educator whose work has been seen in more than 150 international exhibits. His photos, including the one we're, we're talking about today, are collected in numerous museums and private collections. During his career, he has done many assignments for national publications and organizations. He's taught photography at Shepherd College, George Mason University, and to homeless and immigrant youth. He's also the author of five photo books. I met Lloyd uh, when he was a contributor for a book that focused on the story published in 2017. That book was called Unprecedented, and in it we documented the protests and the celebrations around the Trump inauguration. Um, Lloyd, <laughs> thanks for joining us today. And I wanna also thank all the folks watching uh, out there. Thanks for joining us. I know that there are a lot of Homeland fans that are tuning in, uh, but for those who've never seen the show, 
Um, let me give us some context first before we dive into our discussion. I, I want to actually play uh, the clip from, from the show. I'll, I'll play about 30 seconds of it. Uh, hold on. And uh, let me find it. Um, so the... Um, the show, the show actually just wrapped up, right? It's, it's, it was on for eight seasons, and then it, um, the season finale was this, was this, uh, this past month or last month in April. We, had you ever seen the show before, Lloyd? No, <laughs> I have. Believe it or not, I don't own a television and haven't owned one since 1970. Though I have seen the clips, and I have uh, seen pieces of the show at, with friends' homes, but I'm not a regular. I'm not a television watcher. Well, here's I have I'm, seen the clips, and it, I'm, I'm going to play the, the the intro. This plays for at the beginning of, of each show, and it's it's every year the intro changes a little bit, and your your picture is featured some seasons more than than others. This is from the first season. The air and naval forces of the United States has launched a series of strikes against terrorists. The ascension acts of terror in Africa and Sudan. This will not stand this aggression against the uh, U.S. relentless pursuit. The USS Cole was attacked while we're fueling in the port of This was an act of terrorism. It was a despicable. Okay. So, I'm going to be honest with you, Lloyd. Uh, your picture kind of creeps me out, man. Um, <laughs> in the context of the show, uh, it definitely does. I, I, I know a lot of people, and myself included, always assumed that the photo is of the show's star, Claire Danes, as a child. Um, you know, why don't we start this off by settling that debate once and for all? Who is the girl in the mask? It's my daughter, Emma Wolf, Emma Sky Wolf. Um, it was made when she was nine years old. She's in her 30s now and a parent. Uh, I had been working on a series of Polaroid photographs as sort of a counterbalanced in my commercial work with a, a camera that made complex images uh, for me, but a little rough. Um, and I decided to write a grant and I got a, some grant money from the Arlington Arts Commission to document a year of my daughter's life with this camera. And I had a show with it. I was uh, of about 20 pictures. The, sh the piece was called One Kid, One Kid. Um, and I wrote the grant during the run up to Passover and there's a song called One Kid, One Kid. And uh, Emma was very involved in the making of these pictures. Uh, that, um, and that particular one was without writing, it made a big negative. And a black and white. We, we, let's. Um, I've got some of the pictures from that series. Let me yeah. um, let me find that, and we'll put that up there so so folks can know what you're talking about when you say it was without writing. Um, so this is so it was your daughter, not yeah. not Claire Danes. Okay. No, not at all. Never met her. I've actually <laughs> seen her on television, um, talking a little bit about that pic. She briefly mentions the picture, but she doesn't say it's her or not her. She says some of the pictures in the opening are of her. Yeah. This one is not of her. But so this is, the, is this is the picture of, of Emma in, in, in the um, in the mask. But the, the pictures you were talking about, this is also Emma? Yes. From this around the, the same time, within a month or two of the other one. Okay, so go ahead. I, I interrupted you. You were talking about, yeah, about this some is, of she, this one is consciously made. She, it was her, believe it or not, her Halloween costume, which I made with her. Mostly, I made, and um, this picture, like the other one, is was in the Corcoran's Museum of Art's collection or gallery of art. Now it transferred to the Katzen Museum's collection. Um, this and this was also from that series, uh, the, the double exposed in camera. And you get the idea, you see that I would write sort of mini poems, koans, prayers, whatever, commentary on the pictures. When I did the one of the lion mask, I had, you know, with be, being a Polaroid, I got an instant negative and an instant print, you know, one of those little prints. And I saw it and I, it looked pretty much like this. I just said, don't touch it. It just, 
has too many potentials of meaning, layers of meaning that can be in that picture. Don't, anything I would do would just detract and distract from it. As far as writing something on there? Yeah, it would, it would have been about the writing and not about the picture. I just thought it was very pure. So this is a, this is a Polaroid image then. Yeah. You took this with a Polaroid camera. I, when I think about Polaroid cameras, I think about the brown ones with the rainbow. Um, one, I can show it to you. Yeah, yeah, please do. It's, all right, it's a, I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, we can, um, we can even make that a little bigger. Okay, it's a, it's a Polaroid 250 folding camera. You know, it took a, it takes pack film. You can still buy some films for it. I think Fuji makes it, Polaroid does not. And the film that I used on this is no longer made and doesn't work. I have one old pack. Let me grab it. Type 665. <laughs> it's unopened, but it's, you know, 14 years out of date and it no longer works. Uh, Polaroid does not age well. It, there's chemicals in it to dry out. So what we got was a big negative. You know, if I recall, you, you get, you peel them apart, right? You peel them apart and you have a negative right. on one and side you, and then the positive you, image on, the, on yeah. the other. And you would coat, you had a little white stick of goo and you'd coat the print with it. And then the negative would be put in water and washed. Um, sometimes you coat it with another, chem, put another chemical on it, hang it up and dry it, make a print. Um, and I really liked the picture. It was in the exhibition. I thought it was one of the better ones. There are other pictures of her in similar poses that were in the show wearing masks, nothing like this. They're just goofy. So, goofy. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. So, so the mask that she's wearing, you, you, you showed the other one that was a Halloween costume. Was this a ho from a Halloween costume as well? No. Um, I'm not actually sure what it was for, but it was definitely not Halloween. In a picture, in my memory is the picture was taken in the summer. You can tell by your dress. I, I'd have to do some real looking mm -hmm. to find the date. But it was in 93 and when she was nine. And she was playing in the front yard and she, you know, there was this whole fantasy thing going on and dress up and she just pulled that mask put it on her face and she was aware of this process. I wasn't like, you know, she's old enough to have a sense of it and participate in it and go, you know, look at me, take my picture. And she, I think she made a little roar or growl, but she stood there and I said, hold it. And um, unlike most of the time when you make a picture, you don't really know if it's gonna work, you know? And this one, it immediately I had the sense of its possibilities because it, it the film is uh, without going into too much tech is is orthochromatic not panchromatic so it flattens out some of the tones the mask looks like flesh rather than pla it's plastic in my mm -hmm. memory as if it was like pale yellow or something but it it's transformed so it really look and it's the right size it really looks like a little lion head and it, it really does, and and her her hands in, in the position they're in are, are, are adorable and creepy at the same time. Right, um, yeah. and she's wearing that little jumper. Were you were you doing a photo shoot with her at the time, or did she just run up to you and say, "Daddy, take my picture"? Um, I was probably babysitting. <laughs> you know, we're kids sitting. She's too old to babysit, but um, I had that camera with me a lot, and it was you know she was aware of it. I don't think she asked me to do the picture. Sometimes, sometimes like the picture you saw with the writing with the Halloween mask and the Shekhinah stuff, we went on a trip to make that picture, you know, like down to the park and do that. And um, They were set up. They were, uh, you, yeah, not you, always. You, you most knew kind of what you wanted when you took her to the park, you knew sort of the vision, you had a vision in your, in your mind. I oh imagine. yeah, they were, they were thought through. There were some not this one it just happened but it was but i think you know you have this line if you want to catch baseballs it's a good idea to hang on the ball field they're not going to fall on you in a soccer field um and we 
I put myself in a position to receive this kind of information. Um, sometimes it comes through and sometimes you're able to see it. Uh, the picture is very simply framed. There's not a lot, it's not com a complex composition, but sometimes very basic things are, um, have the most meaning. They, it strips away um, any distractions. But it's it is it has a natural feel also because of the orthochromatic it feels like it was taken a long time ago. Yeah, uh, it, yeah it, absolutely. It, um, it, it feels more like almost like a Lewis Carroll Dodgson picture from the nineteenth century. Yeah, it has that it has that sort of timeless element to it. Let, let's 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 skip forward. Uh, your daughter you took the picture in ninety three. Homeland came on. I'm assuming about 10 years ago maybe. about 10 years ago yeah about 10 years ago how, how did you find out uh, that uh, your Im image was being used in in homeland or did you sell them the photo in, in well it's complicated i not long before it came it must have been 2011 not long before homeland put it out i it was on the cover of my favorite magazine called the sun sun magazine and about that you know and i let people know and about that time two or three people emailed me and said you know that picture's on this including the photo editor at the sun said you know this is on this tv show and i went uh <laughs> now i do and then i got a check from uh, the stock agency where it was held and then I went. So this is a up. stock photo. This is a stock yeah. photo. Right. That's and how it ended, ended up. It was. I was originally with a wonderful agency called Swanstock. Mary Virginia Swanson is known in the photo world. Um, picked a lot of photography. Had an agency full of people who kind of crossed between the fine art world and the commercial world and the journalistic world. And I, they had a lot of work of mine. She got bought out by Image Bank. It was called Swanstock. Swansock was bought out by Image Bank, which was Codex stock agency. Then Getty ate up every stock agency in the world, and my work was migrated to Getty's collection. Um, they returned most of my work, but they didn't return that one. And that one I get a check from. They take the big cut. I don't get that much for it. So, so when it was on the cover of the Sun Sun magazine, yeah, was that? That was also, uh, they just found it in the stock. Um, no, I sent it to you them. You sent it to, to, to them. Yeah. It had been used previously through Swanstock, licensed through Swanee, to, I think its first use was for Make-A-Wish Foundation, used it in their annual report very nicely. A Danish rock band, I've never actually seen the cover. I've only seen a small reproduction, used it. And then it was used on the cover of Ms. Magazine, colorized by really? them. Um, and what was the context for the Ms. Magazine cover? It was a story about women and, mytho and um, mythology, which mm -hmm. makes sense given the picture. Yeah, interesting. Because it has a, a sense of, you know, it has a f sort of like a Grimm's fairy tale tone to it. Yeah. Um, let me let me pause right there for, for a second. I, I want to remind folks, um, this is not going to be a long conversation today. So if you have a question you want to ask Lloyd, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the, of the screen. There's, it's over towards the right of your dashboard. Um, so I'm sorry to, to interrupt Lloyd, but um, this, I mean, so, so you've never seen the show, Showtime, I mean, uh, Home, Homeland, uh, all, no. all these years that your, your image was on. But did you see how they were using it? Yes. Because okay. I could find, I was able to find the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the promo online and actually somebody, I think the first time I saw it, a friend of mine who lives in Atlanta said, do you know this? She knew the picture. Mm -hmm. um, she was a friend around, the, we were pretty close around the time the picture was made. And she said, you know, you ought to check out this picture of Emma. I just saw it on my promo. And she sent me her password so I could watch it. I guess it's on Showtime or HBO mm -hmm. or something. Showtime, right. Showtime. And so I could watch it on my screen. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> you know, did a few screen captures. Because it's used, I mean, it's specific to the show, 
but they t tonally, you know, in terms of mood, they hit it. Yeah. You know, a potential. It's not, I think, quite as dark as they use it, but that if you if you look it up, there is a, a thing um, with Claire Danes talking, I think, to Stephen Colbert. Or yeah, whatever. Stephen Colbert, right. Yeah, about it. And she says, what does the opening mean? She says, I don't know. <laughs> you, know they, they th you know, I think it's the idea was to throw out a lot of complex images to sort of set the tone for the show, which I understand is, you know, very thoughtful and, and, and you know, thriller um cerebral well you know i i've in researching our you know preparing for our talk I, I searched on the internet girl in the lion mask and you bring up all these conversations on on message boards and they they they're debating what does it mean what does it mean and and, and there's some um people say well it's greek mythology uh you know especially where they're in the maze you know the the old myth about the minotaur which of course is not a lion head but a but a um, bull um, so there, it was interesting to me that that uh, you told me about the Miz cover and the context for that because I hadn't uh, hadn't realized that there was actually um, some some connection to to mythology with your photo. Um, and the character in Homeland, uh, she struggles with um, mental illness. She's bipolar throughout the eight seasons. It's a big part of the show. So a lot of people have theorized that it has something to do with her her um, her her mental condition. Um, well, it, I think they're using that opening to to do that, and by throwing in images that are um, complex and multi, you have multi modes of of, of meaning um, potentially that that kind of hints at that. Uh, I think the picture stands on its own, obviously, but I'm. I've been pleased that it it has been used this way. I think it's a legitimate, you know, I'm a commercial photographer, People, all kinds of pictures get used, but this one actually matters as a picture and it has resonance, obviously, with a lot of people, you know. Does, does the original positive image, does it exist today? Is it? Yeah, somewhere I'd have to do some <laughs> real looking. Um, I have, I kept those Polaroids in a book, series of books. And my guess is it's in the negative files. I could look it up, yeah. It looks pretty much like that print. It's a little bit lighter. Another piece of tech is in order to get, because the Polaroid negative, you don't build on it like you do when you develop film where you know, silver is migrated onto a negative, it's built in, it's more like a reductive process. So you had to overexpose a little bit to get a negative that would print well. So it's probably a little bit lighter. The dress is probably a little blown out, but it looks pretty much like that. You know, I was kind of like, oh my God, you know, giving me the thought to go look it up. It would be, it, it, I do remember that it looked very similar to that final. So the, so the pieces that are, are, I think you told me that this um, image is at the Katzen. Um, it, I believe so. Yeah. So you would yeah, have taken, the, the Corcoran had seven of my pieces and I'm about 99% sure that was one of them. I'd have so to you would have taken that. the negative image and, and made a print out of that. Oh, yeah, image. 16 by 20 prints. Um, the one in the show is made probably from a scan off an eight by 10. Let me, um, because I, I promised that this was going to be a short show today. Let me, let me, let's go to Q and A. Sure. Um, I'm going to get David uh, Mosher. David, uh, if you're out there, David, go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Hello. Um, hi, Lloyd. Hi, David. David. Can you hear me? Yes. yes I hear you. Have my. Well, I won't worry about my video right now, but um, my question is around. Uh, how I see this photo related to the work of Sally Mann. Mm. And I know she very intentionally used her children in a lot of her work, but uh, I wonder if you could sort of think out loud about that. You know, what do you see there? Yeah, I, I'm aware of Sally Mann's work. I don't know her personally. Um, I have friends who do, I mean, she's a Virginian. Um, 
my relationship to kid, my daughter is different, you know, and I remember actually my daughter and I talking about Sally's work at the time. My daughter didn't like it. Um, I thought she thought it was too intrusive um, emotionally. Um, I, that doesn't take from Sally's work. That was Emma's take. Yeah. Um, but I think there's some things, I think the, that that p particular piece is closest to a photographer named Ralph Eugene Meatyard's work. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, in terms of its structure and sets of meanings. And he did work specifically with masks at, at one point. I mean, uh, he was kind of a hero of mine. I don't think I don't think I was consciously thinking about either of them when I was making the picture, but their their way of looking certainly informed how I react. So Lloyd, uh, uh, several people have asked um, the same question. So let me put this out there for you. Um, did your daughter ever see herself on the show and did she have a reaction about it? Yeah, we talked about it a few times. I mean, it happened when she was in the, it came out in the show when she was already an adult. Um, we were both kind of amused by it because to us, it was something that happened in the front yard, like goofing around. Yeah, um, it's got to be a great dinner starter, right? It's like, hey, I'm in every episode of Homeland for eight seasons. Yeah, she she's asked at one point to get her name off the blog because she was <laughs> dating at the time. And every time anyone, search, you know, people search, you know, people's names before they go out on a date and they would see this and some other pictures. And she was like, get it off. So I did. Um, let me um, let me move. She, I think she was interested in it you know i mean it it's it's wider cultural meaning is separate than our personal experience yeah, yeah um i mean you can say what it means to us but that's only ours that's just it's once it leaves you it has its own life and let me um let me let me just ask this question rather than um, put Lars on the spot. He asked, "Does the lion mask still exist?" I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, if it does, it's my daughter's daughter is playing with it. Oh, because if that's in your house right now, you could put it's that. It's not on in eBay. my. It's not in my house. We you could put it, that it, on it, eBay and and make some money. Oh yeah, if it <laughs> exists, it's, um, that's a thought. If Chris, it exists, Emma has it. Chris O'Leary, if you're out there, Chris, um, I've just unmuted you. Go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Hey, Lloyd. This hey, is Chris. Chris. How are you? How are you? Good. I'm good. Um, I wanted to, and I know, Lloyd, we've worked together, um, um, but I, we never really talked about making that transition to digital photography, which I'm, I'm sure you needed to do uh, in, in news and photography. Like when did you decide, when did you have to make the transition to digital and how do you feel about digital versus your, the Polaroid look and the Polaroid? It's, look? Yeah, it's for us, it's interesting. I was forced to go digital about 19, about 2003 because I was starting to bleed customers. They were, even though in the beginning, digital did not have the quality that film offered, but people liked the convenience and price so I, I just went digital. And there was a period of a couple of years where I was using both. Um, for color work, I don't think I'd ever go back to film. You know, other people have other opinions and I hear you know, people like Dave Burnett using other cameras to get a different look. Um, I don't miss it for color. I do miss this film. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't miss particularly TMAX. I shot a project I'm working on in Jerusalem um, was, has been shot initially with film that I scanned or printed and scanned. And then I switched to digital. I actually prefer digital, but I shoot in black and white in camera. I don't miss it too much, but this Polaroid is unique because every single picture kind of was a bit of a mystery what was going to come out. And there's um, some random chemical stuff that happens along the edges of the image and the, the way that the, the, the old tonality, the, you know, the uncoated lenses has a look to it that's very beautiful. 
and I and the the wonderful edges you strange edges that you get I can't I could simulate it by copying it you know in digital but I miss it and I you know and I miss the um sort of surprise like I said I can, occasionally you can find a, a pack of it on eBay or something but they're very expensive and they don't work mm -hmm. <laughs> um there was a group trying to restart that film type for a bigger camera for four by five cameras called the impossible project but they ran out of money it didn't go anywhere um i i would use it again in a heartbeat because um even though i would have to travel around with an extra camera bag and a jar of water um to put the negatives in and i used to travel with a clothesline with uh, laundry clips to hang the negatives up in like i'd be on the road um yeah you know th there's a a magical quality to those to that stuff and it doesn't look like anybody else's in some ways it was a little bit like my a lot of people were using diana and holga cameras and it was my way of doing my a little bit of that loose the the slick control um that you get particularly with di digital i mean it's super controlled um I happen to like it, but um, I do miss that particular film a lot. I, it, um, and I'm going to um, move on to maybe our final question. We might have time for one more, but um, Susan Sadek, if, if, if you're out there, uh, Susan, um, I've just unmuted you. Go ahead and um, unmute your mic and ask your question. Hi, Lloyd. Um, well, it was answered a little bit before in the last question, but I was wondering what camera you had moved to from the Polaroid and also whether you're mixing in uh, art photography uh, along with your documentary journalism. That's, that's a good question. The latter part is easier. I try to make all my work interesting. <laughs> so the if it's even the best commercial, you know, commercial work, I try, I can't always, to make the best, most interesting picture I can. The instincts to be an artist are the same. Um, I keep several projects going. Most of them are, frankly, journalism. Um, the cameras I've been using, mostly Nikon D700s uh, for my, for my work now and when I travel I use a little mirrorless camera it's a, a Lumix Panasonic which I like a lot and it's a little bit like using a Leica um, but I, the, I don't like the digital filters that f emulate film it seems phony to me mm -hmm. um, yeah I mean if people if people do what they want if the picture works it works um, I I'd rather let the camera do it. I, another camera I do miss a lot, and I did three books with it. Was, I had a, a twin lens reflex camera, I had a Mamiya. Um, I did a book on Vietnam veterans, a book on Jewish mothers, a book on Jewish fathers, and the majority of those pictures were made with a twin lens camera. And there's a, there's certain, it's not so much the film, it was the the way the camera slowed everything down. The last big project I actually did with film was on Holocaust survivor couples. And it just, it wasn't, to, I'd make my test with digital, but it felt better to slow down with the bigger camera. Um, and I, actually, if they made a, a digital version of it, I would use it, but they don't. So um, there are a lot of ways to make art and I'm not particularly hung up on, the method though that the the method used does affect the outcome and that picture we're discussing today could not have been done with a with a digital machine last question um pradip uh if if you're out there um i've unmuted you please uh unmute yourself and ask your question hello good afternoon um uh, thanks for hosting this show. Uh, I, I have a question about what do you see some of the basic attributes to become a successful visual storyteller? Uh, from your experience, what have you found? Empathy um, is the big one with other people. 
um, because that's the bottom line. It's about communication. Um, flexibility, that if you go in pre-planning things, you don't know. And then patience. I think those are big ones. How you edit a story is very complicated and tell a story. Um, I, I'm not sure I want to open that box. <laughs> uh, it, I, it's mostly instinctual for me. Um, but I think, you know, and then obviously you have to have a certain amount of passion and then um, learn the technique. I mean, the, you know, pick a, pick a method of storytelling, whether it's, you know, writing a story or, or a movie or, or photographs and get competent at the technique. If you're an intelligent person and care, you will learn it. But um, passion for the story is, the, is probably the big one because it drives everything else. You know, if you care and have, then everything else kind of falls into place. Because, you know, I used to teach and, you know, a student, you'd be better off with a student who really cared than somebody who's very, very technical because you need both. But a, a bright person who's passionate about something will learn the technique. Someone who's very, very technical um, will have trouble um, sometimes learning what, how to communicate, how to, to be poetic. Um, I mean, the, the whole com storytelling is complicated. How do you create a narrative? Is narrative even worthwhile? I and mean, this picture tells a story with one image or, or a variety of stories. Um, I just, you know, I put out some books since you tell the story, something was combined with writing. Um, yeah, passion, patience. <laughs> Those are the big ones. <laughs> I think that I think you hit it right on the on the head with with passion. I mean, technically sound pictures, they, they I mean you can just tell they they sort of lack that soul and that you know. Yeah, that, my my all time favorite of them is you used to see them in some of the trade publications. It'd be a an elaborate lighting diagram and pages of technical stuff, and then they would show you the final picture, and it would be, you know, some pretty young woman in a bikini standing in front of a motorcycle. And it's like, you know, really, <laughs> you needed all this to make that picture. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, there was nothing to it. Whereas sometimes, you know, the something you do have to have the technique because it doesn't come out and, and isn't readable by an audience. It doesn't have any meaning, but you can learn that stuff. My favorite line comes from my friend, Paul Brown who when people ask him, what kind of camera do you, did you use to take that picture? His answer is, um, you're asking me the wrong question. <laughs> you have to ask me how much of my life did I put in that picture? Wow. You know, and I think that's the answer. You know, what do you want to communicate to whom and why? And then, then things start to come together. You'll figure it out. Excellent. Excellent um, response to that question. Thank you for that, Lloyd. So we, we come to the end of the show, um, and it's uh, we didn't mention that you've actually had lots of inquiries from people all over the world who want, who like want this image. And and so if you're interested, uh, fan of the show or fan of great photography, you can email Lloyd at Lloyd at LloydWolf.com, and he'll fill you in on sizes and prices and, and all that good stuff but um uh and you actually signed the image lloyd yes okay yeah the it's front lloyd or the wolf. Back? yeah and lloyd wolf at lloydwolf.com yep. and i'm happy to you know i like to share pictures so it's always a compliment when somebody has enough meaning that they you know a picture means so much they want to have it so um, i'm happy to you know somebody's interested just be in touch excellent I uh, want to thank our sponsors. Their um, support really allows us to do these shows for free. Uh, Fujifilm, Tamron, Multiple Exposures Gallery, Peak Design, Capital Photography Center, and KEH Camera, which is a new uh, sponsor that's uh, starting today. So uh, thank you to all of those great uh, brands. 
the um, next week, we're going to have a live critique session on Friday, uh, four to six with the DC Street Photography Collective. Uh, we're going to have some prizes that we're going to award. And if you want to enter, you have until Sunday night to do so. Uh, go to our Facebook page uh, to find a link, or you can find a link on our on our website, uh, focusonthestory.org. Um, so a little over the time that I, I said we would try to keep this short, but it was really um, a great conversation, and, and we really couldn't cut it um, at a half an hour. Uh, Lloyd, I want to thank you for, for joining us. Um, it's really been a pleasure to, to talk to you today, and just it's been great getting to know you over the last couple of years. I uh, really appreciate everything you do for the community. We didn't even get into some of the great projects you're working on, and, and maybe that'll be some fodder for um, a future show. Um, I want to let you have the last word, if, if there's anything you want to say before we uh, take off. Well, I want to say, first of all, thank you to you, Joe, and the work you're doing for the photo community. It's, it's, it's important and much appreciated. And the, it creative how you do it. Um, and I want to thank everyone for their interest in the picture um, and in my work. And I hope it has meaning for you and that it can inspire you to look and keep your own closer at the world and look more intensely and thoughtfully at, at what's before you. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, this show is uh, a recording of it is on our Facebook page. And we'll also be posting it to our YouTube channel and to the um, um, website. Uh, someone uh, asked to go back to the to the buy a print um, uh, page. You can go to the recording and get that. It's at Lloyd Wolf at LloydWolf.com. That's his email address. Email email Lloyd for, for information about his prints. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and hope to see you next week. Thanks, Lloyd. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.